We're going to talk about many different topics. We're going to dive right in. I'm going to ask Blythe a little bit about her start um, and uh, how she uh, conquered the world of finance and then started her own company. So Blythe, let's start there. I've watched your tapes and, and read about you. You describe yourself as a penniless student when you graduated college. Tell us a little bit about how you started in the finance world and sort of almost accidentally ended up at JP Morgan. Yep, uh, thank you, and um, thanks for only referencing two decades. So we'll, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, I'm so, a gal of a certain age <laughs> myself. <laughs> so, so back in the uh, late 80s when I was 12, <laughs> or maybe more, um, between uh, school and university, it was quite common in those days, uh, probably still is, for Brits to take a year, a gap year sure. off. And, I wanted to travel, I had aspirations to uh, do irresponsible things in South America, which I ultimately did, um, but I needed to fund the travel, and so I, I actually wrote a, a slew of cold call type letters to uh, banks in the city of London, not knowing the difference at that time between a high street bank, a commercial bank, an investment bank, or a merchant bank. And, um, Surprisingly, two of them responded. Uh, one of them was Continental Illinois, that most of you probably don't remember, uh, but met an ignominious end not that long thereafter for irresponsible lending in the oil patch, I think. And it was wound up by the FDIC. Uh, the other one was this little outfit called Morgan Guarantee Limited, um, which at the time was the Section 20 sub of, of JP Morgan uh, in, in Europe. Uh, this is back in the pre-Glass-Steagall yeah. repeal days. And, and they said, sure, you know, we'll hire you, come in, you can be a, a temp. And um, that's how I got started. And that temp job at JP Morgan, if I'm not correct, you were the youngest person to ever make MD at JP Morgan or vice president? At the time. At the time. I, you know, it's, that's going back all 28 years old. Yeah, I, I mean, that was incredible. Yeah, uh, I was unqualified actually, but um, I don't know how they let me slip through, to be honest. But it, it must have been pretty smart, I'm, yeah. I have a feeling. But that did not happen while I was a temp. You know, there was quite, there was quite, a, quite a while. Yeah, we're skipping a, a few yeah, years. Yeah, I started off photocopying, and somewhere along the line, someone discovered that I was reading what I was photocopying. <laughs> and what I was reading um, was swaps documentation and, um, and analysis. And, you know, this, so 1987, uh, derivatives were, you know, a real brand new thing. I think the very first interest rate swap was conducted roughly 1983, something like that. But this was still a by appointment market, you know, heavily negotiated, no real liquidity. And when uh, JP Morgan discovered that I actually, you know, understood a bit of math and economics and things and was going off to read economics at Cambridge, they said, ah, oh, so maybe, maybe we can actually teach you what swaps actually are. And that, that's how my career began. I actually learned derivatives uh, in, starting in 1987, first working on accounting and uh, confirmations. And um, back in those days, swaps were accrual accounted for. And it was quite the controversy uh, to switch that to mark-to-market -market accounting, not least because it had significant implications for the income statement of big Well, with an, in an interview with Dave and Rubenstein, he asks you, I guess somewhere in the public record, you are credited with actually inventing the credit default swap, and then you demur and say it wasn't just me, but clearly you were part of that. <laughs> well, so technically, like, I think the standard is for you to invent something, you have to think it up for the first time, yeah. and therefore you cannot have a memory that you're gonna to confess to where someone explained what one was to you. Yes. <laughs> so unfortunately, I have that memory, so definitively I have to disclaim not, uh, you know, I did not invent uh, credit derivatives, but I certainly did help um, turn them from a, you know, a, a hypothetical idea for an instrument into what became a, you know, big global marketplace yes. uh, with, with many applications, uh, some of them less wise than others. Uh, and as you know, uh, some bright spark uh, applied uh, derivative technology to subprime home equity uh, beginning in about 2005, accelerating in 06 and 07, and the rest, as we know, is somewhat history. The press got a hold of that and decided that I had invented financial weapons of mass destruction and caused the world financial crisis. So there you have it. That's how that happens. Well, at least you're financially famous. So in, in that long career, J.P. Morgan, what were, your, what were your last couple jobs, and then how did you take the leap into starting digital assets? Well, so 
basically over the course of what became 27 years with JP Morgan, initially in London, most you of it. You outed your in, two decades. Yeah, I, I know, it was a long time. Yeah. <laughs> most of it, started, starting in London, the vast majority of the time in, in the US. I did um, many, many different roles, and actually that was one of the, the great things about working for a firm like that. Um, it changed yeah. radically. I mean, so when I joined JP Morgan, it was 12,000 people strong. It was still AAA rated, and it was a pretty sleepy commercial bank yeah. with a small Section 20 securities sub in, in Europe. And by the time I left, I don't know, I'd lost count, but it was, you know, uh, you know over a quarter of a million people. And Juggernaut. I mean, just, a, you know, behemoth. Um, and I moved around and did a lot of roles. I, I spent uh, all of my time in and around uh, the investment banks. So I never, never was in asset management or, or consumer. Um, but I built what became big global franchise businesses for the firm, the structured credit business in the 90s, the global commodities business later in the, in the 2000s. Um, I ran a global credit portfolio uh, twice actually, once before and once after the JP Morgan Chase combination. Different job, second time around, a uh, little more challenging. That coincided with 2001, Enron, WorldCom, dot-com bubble bursting, yes. all sorts of bad stuff. JP Morgan, you know, got out, uh, navigated the great financial crisis in 07, 08, 09, uh, very relatively successfully. It did not do so well in 2001, and actually a lot of the lessons that were learned in 2001 were, were reasons or contributed to, to why the bank did better a uh, second time around. Yes. Um, I, uh, I also, uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, uh, looked after regulatory affairs. I definitely did something wrong to, oh, wow. to, uh, <laughs> to deserve that. Um, as a night job, the day job, I was running a, the global commodities business, a 3,000 person trading operation. So that, that, was, uh, that was challenging. Uh, and then I did a stint also as CFO of the Global Investment Bank. So through all that time, you know, I had I had innovated um, yeah. in different contexts, um, and I had developed an entrepreneurial itch that I wanted to scratch. Uh, and in 2014, um, I helped the bank sell the commodities business that I had built for them, and was at that time running, um, largely to appease regulators who were unhappy with the firm for a number of reasons, uh, not limited to commodities. And I. Uh, chose not to travel with that business, could have stayed with uh, JP Morgan, but had developed the sense that I wanted to, you know, I wasn't sure that really inventing things with the fabric of a gigantic firm, you know, and the safety net around you that that represents really counts as entrepreneurialism. Um, so I wanted to see if I could do that for real on my own. And I also had developed a point of view um, that sort of began in around 2009 or 10, that there was something going on in the fintech space yes. that was somewhere on the spectrum between scary and very exciting, depending on kind of where you sat or, or your perspective. And that our firm and our, my industry was very much um, ignoring, potentially to its peril, but understandably, because if you think about the decade that you know, ensued after the financial crisis, I mean, this was ex an ex existential uh, you know, threat uh, to the continuation of banking as we knew it, and, and banks were inwardly focused, uh, recapitalizing the business, uh, restoring stability, dealing with being in the regulatory penalty box, and so on. And meanwhile, you know, in 2009, you know, all our Blackberries went out the window, and then came the smartphone. Yeah, Blackberry remember, remember that? Still. Yeah. Yeah. And so that yeah. was the beginning of a revolution. Yeah. Um, that came, it wasn't just about mobile, but it was about, you know, the internet, you know, broadband, yeah. sort of cloud computing, um, reductions in the cost of uh, compute and, and data storage, all these things were fueling this revolution in fintech, and there were, this was this furious innovation that was sort of chipping away at the traditional domain of the regulated banking sector. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. That's what led to digital asset. So you take the plunge, which I give you a lot of credit as an entrepreneur myself, after being in house in a big corporate like that, to take the plunge is not easy, very scary. You start digital assets. I saw you on the cover of some magazine where they said blockchain. So you were obviously a big proponent of blockchain. But let's fast forward. It's only because I was female, just for the record. I, I loved that. Yeah, though. like um, you know, it was Bloomberg. It was Bloomberg. Yeah. But look it up. It's really fierce. It's like woman <laughs> on the cover, blockchain. Um, 
So let's fast forward into Motive. Mm. Um, so Motive is a private equity firm focused on the fintech space. Mm. Um, tell us a little bit about Motive, why it's different, and then I want to make sure we get into fintech AI and all the yeah. things I know the audience is really interested in. Yeah. So um, I spent four years with Digital Asset, you know, from zero to, um, you know, no, there were no clients, no pitch book, no capital, Been no product. Been there so hard. Awful, <laughs> difficult. But, you know, we made great progress. The company's still going strong, a uh, terrific company. Um, uh, took it to the point we'd done several rounds of capital and, and contracted our first customers. And then the job evolved to being an enterprise software delivery job, which I wasn't really right. best. Uh, and you knew you could be an skilled. entrepreneur, so maybe it was time for yeah. another round. So I then decided to finally take the year off that I never managed to take at any point prior in my career. And um, a chap called Rob Havert started chasing me around the world uh, during that year. And Rob is the founder and managing partner uh, of Motive. And obviously, having worked on Wall Street for as long as I did, I knew many, if not all, of the major uh, financial sponsors, the private equity firms. Um, and I, and I, th I thought what Rob was doing um, uh, sounded legitimately differentiated from anything that I had come across. Um, and so that was December 2019. Um, at that point, it was a vision. And uh, to his credit, and to the credit of the rest of the team, you know, that vision has now evolved into you know, a, a, ver a very functional reality. And, and the, the gist of what was different were, were, were basically two big things. One is um, the firm is a, it's a private equity business. We, we're a private investment firm. We invest stage agnostically from incubation, venture, all the way through to growth and buyout. But we only do financial technology investing, nothing mm -hmm. else. So we're obsessed with it. That's all we do. We're deeply focused. We're a mile, mile deep in yeah. our sector. Um, and I'll come back to why I think that's relevant yeah. for that, this particular sector and important. Um, there's a role for generalists, but, but this is a gigantic sector. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's subject to radical digital um, disruption uh, and will continue to be and super interesting for that reason. The second thing, aside from this, the specialization that's different about us, is, is the way that we uh, create value. Um, and, uh, and that is using a, uh, something that we refer to in shorthand as being an, the IOI operating model. It stands for investors, innovators, operators, or if I could get that right, investors, operators, innovators, I. Oh, three I, words, whatever. Whatever, whatever. middle up. <laughs> and, and of, okay, okay, so having investment skills, financial engineering skills, it's kind of table stakes. You don't have that, you kind of back to square one. Yeah. But, but an, a relative to others uh, in our industry, a much heavier than customary uh, focus on and allocation of resources to in house operating talent and in house technology and innovation capability. So we're about 240 call it 40 people uh, globally now, um, 170 of those people are technologists. Full-time, devoted to motive, on the books, paid for by us, which for a small firm on its third you know, flagship product is, uh, is you know, an unusual s scale. Yes, um, and tell us about the FinTech space. In some ways, I was saying to you before, FinTech got a little bit of a black eye, or seems to, because of the VC world and startups and failures and growth versus profits. But there are a lot of mature FinTech companies that exactly. are worth investing in. So why don't you reframe FinTech for everyone and where we are with it? Well, I mean, let, let's start by you know, thinking about, what, first of all, what is the sort of conventional private equity playbook? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I'll apply it okay. to this context. Sounds because, um, which, and no offense to the people that built unbelievable investment businesses and have driven an amazing amount of allocation of capital over the years. But the, the, the playbook is buy cheap as possible, apply maximum leverage at you know, ever decreasing costs until recently, and, uh, cut costs to the bone, and then flip the business for some um, you know, significant in increase in terms of multiple yes. into the wide open arms of the uh, happy IPO market. Right. All four of those. Not so happy IPO. Right, well, all, <laughs> debatably, all four of those uh, vectors are gone. I mean, we could have a debate about whether buying cheap is easier today than it was two years ago. There certainly are businesses that are cheaper than they were, more affordable. But 
some of them are cheaper for a good reason, yeah. and others, you know, that are still great businesses, there's a lot of dry powder chasing not so many of them. So it's just not that easy to yeah. buy cheap right now. If everyone's like, oh, I do single digit EBITDA multiples, like, yeah, but the ones that come at that price are just not that great yeah. for a reason. You know, so buy cheap is tough. You know, cut costs to the bone. You know, cutting costs to glory is, it's an old playbook. It's, it's not how you're going to win in this particular space, not yeah. with the, the extent of disruptive transformation. Means. Yeah. Cheap leverage went out the window two years ago, and wide open IPO markets ain't happening. So the playbook has to change. And in that context, doing value creation the hard way, which is by actually legitimately creating value, is what is required. And that's what we built the premise of this firm around, is the notion that, that having deep insider knowledge of the sector by having a significant stable of people that have spent decades running major firms as well as small firms, but as operators, and in-house technology knowledge that means that not only can we evaluate the state of technology in a sector, in a firm, in an opportunity, but we can actually change it yeah. and help a, an entrepreneur do that. That's what changed the playbook. And why is that particularly helpful in, in financial technology um, is because it is a gigantic space. You know, it's, it's about a trillion, it's approaching a trillion dollars a year of spend um, by financial services firm on, on, firms on technology. Yeah. And then adjacent to that, that's the vertical, which isn't small. And then adjacent to that, um, there is a roughly $100 billion growing to about seven or $800 billion over the next five years of what we'll call loosely embedded finance. So this is non-financial services businesses embedding financial technology capabilities into their right. stack somehow. Right. So, you know, think transport, you know, with payment capabilities. I could go on, you know, German dentists with a payment and portal and all, you know, all that sort of stuff. So enormous, enormous space. Um, and you've got, you know, people say the word fintech and people think, oh, blockchain, crypto, startup, yeah. venture, yeah. West Coast. And that's like such a complete miss in terms of truly appreciating the, the, the complexity, the scale, the significance, and the impact of this is I, know, this I feel space. like FinTech needs a rebrand. It, well, you know, repositioning. Noticed, <laughs> I, I've not been saying FinTech. I've been yeah. saying financial technology, okay. and I've been doing that for a reason. I haven't thought you'd probably be better at rebranding it, than me, but that's my attempt, is to, yeah. is to sort of make people actually focus on what it is. actually saying what, what yeah. it is and what it is that we do. And, and uh, again, what's going on in this space is it's about a combination of some massive sec, you know, long-term structural changes that are not cyclical, that will survive all the noise of rates and all the other fun stuff that's going on in the world. Um, and on the one hand, so that's creating demand and opportunity, and then on the other hand, a confluence of the coming of age simultaneously of a, of a whole raft of modern technologies that are individually incredible, but collectively, it's just a, it's an irresistible force. Yeah. Um, and I, I rattled off a number of them uh, earlier. Uh, and what, what that is driving um, is a moment where in the financial technology space, we are, we are seeing and are going to see uh, creation of value on the scale of what happened in the world of media and search and advertising when Google emerged. Yeah. And what happened to e-commerce uh, and ultimately, um, uh, computing capacity with the advent of Amazon. And, and would you say we're in the AOL that. phase of that? Yeah, where, well, yeah, where we're somewhere we? between the you know the Stone Ages <laughs> and the AOL yeah. phase, depending on which part of the business you look at. But it's ridiculous that we have you know autonomous vehicles driving around the streets, and we don't have T plus less than two settlement, and we're like galvanizing ourselves to get to T plus one, and it's like a massive industry crisis, and you know, uh, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's extraordinary how backward the processing of parts of uh, financial capabilities are with you know, faxes and emails and human uh, capital deployed in ultra low value, high cost activities that produce you know, poor quality results in terms of customer experience and satisfaction. Um, and that is all going to change with the deployment of uh, modern technology with uh, cloud native uh, systems that are modular, that can evolve much more quickly, um, that cost much less to run, that are much easier to um, switch on and off or choose elements of rather than having to buy the whole enchilada. 
um, that will allow ultra personalization of capabilities so that you know what's recommended to you is specific to you and what's recommended to you is, a, is appropriate for you and that takes the advisor out of the business of managing admin and puts her into the job of advising a client and sourcing opportunity and, and, and doing value added um, activity. And this is all in the context of the, the biggest intergenerational transfer of wealth the world has ever seen. Um, and nobody that's inheriting that wealth operates the way that their you know, predecessors did. Massive, massive shift in the rate of digital engagement at the level of individuals and institutions, which was already super underway and driven by you know, what began in 2009 in mobile and before that in the internet, but got massively accelerated through COVID to, and that, that will never go back. And you know, even our grandparents know how to use Zoom now. Like, like it's you know, we really <laughs> we're sort of beyond. And 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 uh, so-called democratization of of uh, access. So the rise of the self-directed investor, the, the active investing middle class, not just here in the United States, but the rise of the middle classes around around the world who have investable, disposable income and savings, um, and and a digital inclination to do that. All of that has to be. Um, served. So and then we have to talk about AI. We only have yeah. five minutes left. Well, AI there. is exactly. I know that. everyone's dying to hear your point of view on AI. We just came back from the World Economic Forum. I was lucky enough to sit next to you at a dinner, and everyone was pummeling you with AI questions. So, you know, give the audience your perspective on AI. What can we expect? What should everyone in this room be thinking right now? What's your point of view on? how AI yeah. is going to transform So, uh, and Davos on this topic was entertaining because if oh anyone's God, been, the been there, <laughs> you know, Davos goes in, you know, like, you know what the new thing is. You just have to look at the, you know, the, the storefronts down yeah. the main Everyone uh, had AI promenade. Yeah. Two years ago, it was like crypto. You couldn't, you couldn't, you just couldn't move for the crypto stuff. <laughs> And like this, and this year is AI absolutely everything, including a bunch of companies have got absolutely no business claiming that they're doing AI. But whatever, why not? You know, <laughs> why not? It worked with crypto. It could work with this. So, so well, there, there was a when thing. we all put dot com at the end of our, yeah, exactly. our name. It was so exactly the it's same. Similar. It, it's dot AI now. Like all your yeah. it's dot AI or die. I'm telling. You. So, so it, it's tempting to say that there's a lot of um, hype. Uh, and there, there absolutely, uh, you know, are some jokers out there. But, but this is not, a, this is not hype. This is a massive, massively consequential leap forward in technology capability that will change mankind, uh, for better or for worse, profoundly. It's, it's, you know, the, you know, the smartphone came along in 2009. We had absolutely no idea what the implications of that were. We kind of knew it might be big, but you know. Mostly, we were confused, yeah. and look what happened. It changed the world. This, yeah. is at le this is a different order of magnitude of Im implication. And you know, the, the positives, I think, have been you know, well articulated. They're, they're super exciting. Um, all you have to do is spend some quality time yourself messing around with um, uh, chat GPT, and you begin to find, think up use cases and applications. We've done thorough evaluations of every single portfolio company in, in, our, in our business. Um, and the, I mean, the possibilities are ridiculous. Like, you know, the, the opportunity to create revenue, but also to tackle some things like, we have some fixer-uppers that are written in with 60 million lines of COBOL code. This is a programming language that doesn't even get taught in schools any longer. You have to get people in off the beaches to kind of tell you what your system does. It works, it's highly performant, but like, you know, it, it's, you know, not exactly modern. We're using generative AI to rewrite cobalt cold, cobalt oh, wow. cold automatically into modern programming That's language amazing. and cutting the cost of that, that kind of technology upgrade and tech debt renov renovation by like 70 to 80% in some cases. It's That's insane. incredible. It's a really interesting use case. By the way, if you have a kid in school like I do who's 16, they, they actually allow some general AI in the class. Mm. And she can put in a really scientific Thing and say, give me the plain English version. It sounds like that's what you're doing with Cobalt. I mean, I see, I mean, I don't know if any. Give me the new version. Just upload, you know, an SEC filing, which I'm sure you really all know. I mean, no human being in their right minds could ever, ever read use that. The, that language. 
and ask it to rewrite it for you. And you have to be careful with the numbers in particular, but it's, you know, um, it's spectacularly powerful. Anyway, this is very much driving what will enable the lower cost of delivery of um, integrated end-to-end -end platform based financial services, uh, advice, execution, post-trade, reporting, accounting, tax, planning, the whole lot is all going to be powered uh, using AI. So we're going to run out of time before we get all of Bly's AI knowledge, but if someone's sitting in the audience, what should they read, where should they go, and what should they do when it comes to AI so that they can be really, truly educated? There's just so much noise. What do you read? Well, I mean, if, if you're a, I mean, I read almost everything I can on yeah. the topic. I mean, there's, and the, the good news is, that, I mean, there's a tons of stuff out there. There's books being written, uh, at, there's a, a great book that just uh, came out by Jack Hydery, uh, CEO of a company uh, called Quantum uh, AQ. Um, okay. Uh, sandbox AQ, sorry, where the Q stands for quantum, the A stands for AI. Uh, it's called AI or die. It's kind of interesting. AI or die, yeah. people. Read uh, that. <laughs> you know, on the subject of AI and dying, uh, you, you could read what um, Henry Kissinger wrote before he died. I talked about that in Davos yes, when we spoke, did. but uh, his thesis on, on this, which is nothing to do with, the, this is more the flip side. Of, of the AI revolution is, is you've got to assume that nation states will all be armed with the same AIs um, and will all have the same challenges with distinguishing fact from fiction in the data that they gather. And his life's work, like it or hate it, was about promoting the cause of uh, diplomacy so that in that physical moment in time that occurs while you maneuver your physical assets and you gather your data and you analyze your intelligence sources and you decide whether you're gonna bomb each other, yes you inject personal knowledge of uh, your counterpart into the conversation and look her or him in the eye, and on the basis of your not mutual agreement, but your mutual understanding of each other, you should be able to prevent the ultimate worst case outcome. He said, now imagine we're all armed with these AIs and you're all running your, your war games, your, your game theory, theorizing. The only logical outcome of, a, of game theory in that context of, of conflict between nations is to preempt because you can't tell what the, the data, the fact from fiction, and everybody has the same analytical tools. I mean, that was fascinating. That's We're scary. End it there, but if you haven't read what Henry Kissinger said about AI before he died, it's worth a look. And if you want to hear more from Blythe Mathers, I happen to know that Ted Seides, who was just on stage, did an hour interview for his podcast with her. So you can get more Blythe from Ted Seides, I guess, <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Have a great conference. <laughs>